Good afternoon. My name is Evan Rutter. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Alumni and Parent Engagement here at Claremont McKenna College, also an alumnus of CMC. And it's a thrill to have you all here in week three of Impact CMC, or the end of week two, my apologies, at Impact CMC. This month is all about going behind the scenes and showing the secret sauce of all things that make CMC truly exceptional. And today we're focusing on CMC's research institutes. It also coincides with the 1946 challenge, which is one of our biggest fundraising drives for the college. Our goal is to get 1,946 donors in 1,946 minutes, including a lot of options to donate to these incredible research institutes. So if you haven't yet, go to cmc.edu 1946 and contribute to the college or any specific part of the college that you do wish. So welcome everybody. A few things about Zoom. At the very bottom, you'll see a chat button and a participant button. If you click those buttons, the chat box and the participant box will open to your right. In the chat feature, it's interactive, it's open. Please put in thoughts, comments, questions. Uh, feel free to use that uh, to share some of your, your thoughts, ideas, concerns. Uh, we'll be reviewing that later. We'll save it, we'll look at it. And of course, we'll follow up uh, if needed. Um, in the participant feature, you can virtually raise your hand. So when we get to Q&A, you might want to ask something directly to one of our student presenters or one of our faculty presenters, and you can click raise hand and we can call on you and you can ask your question directly. So finally, at the very top right, there's gallery view and speaker view, however you prefer to view this, that is up to you. Right now, you should be seeing me, my video is spotlighted and we are in speaker view, but if you want to change that, you're welcome to. Finally, when um, uh, Professor uh, Chung Kim uh, joins us, we will be sharing her screen, so your screen will change temporarily but it will go back um, as soon as we finish that presentation. It's now my pleasure to turn the program over to our co-interim uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty, Shauna Levin. Shauna. Thanks, Evan. Hi, everyone. Um, it is our pleasure to present to you today um, Project 2020 and Beyond. Um, the collective power of the research institutes and centers. So um, before we get into uh, our topic for today, I thought we could start off with some trivia. So I'm going to pass it over to Connie, and she's going to put um, the first of two questions up for you. So if you could please uh, select one of those options and hit submit. How many research institutes and centers do we currently have? Indeed, we have 11 research institutes and centers. 60% of you were right on with that. Um, we also have another trivia question for you. This is our second of two. Connie, go ahead and throw that up there. This is, this is with regard to the names of the research institutes and which institute shares their name with a CMC dorm. I apologize, it is not coming up. Darren, do you, can you help me out? It, it's on my end. Okay. All right, I think we can, yep. There we go. Can everyone see the results of that? Berger Institute of Individual and Social Development indeed shares its name with one of our CMC dorms. Great job, everyone. So um, this was just kind of a way to warm everyone up to um, our 11 research institutes and centers, as well as their different um, names reflective of their different missions. And um, so uh, I guess to tie this to the 1946 challenge, um, what do I love most about CMC? 1946, my, my top reason, of course, is the Research Institute. So why? So for me, I've been um, overseeing the Research Institutes for a few years now and gotten to know each of them uh, pretty well. And the cool thing about the Institutes is that each one of them has their own unique mission. Um, and each also contributes to the collective power of the institutes. So what do I mean there by collective power? So how are the institutes more than just the sum of their parts? Well, we've launched an initiative called Project 2020 last year 
envisioning the future through a multidisciplinary lens. And what we're doing with this overarching initiative with the institutes is really use this umbrella to think about the ways in which the institutes work together to tackle common problems, but from different disciplinary perspectives, different methodologies, different theoretical perspectives, different problems that occupy those fields. And so together, we can tackle problems like global climate change, from the perspective of different disciplines and different research institutes that can bring their resources to bear on this common problem. So what we thought we would do for our session today is we thought we would talk about um, three of our kind of uh, sub themes under our uh, overall umbrella of project 2020. And these sub themes are the global climate change initiative um, led by Bill Asher of the uh, Roberts Environmental Center. Our second theme is the Presidential Initiative on Anti-Racism and the Black Experience in America. Uh, this initiative will develop a long-term structural integrated educational response to racism and inequality and inequity. And our third theme is our ongoing Open Academy Initiative reflected in CMC's commitments to freedom of expression, viewpoint diversity, and effective dialogue. So three of our institute directors and students, student teams, will talk about research and programming around the President's Initiative and the Open Academy. So um, these three uh, institutes are the um, Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies, um, represented today by uh, its director, Professor Hilary Apple, who will also introduce the student uh, working with her at the Keck Center. Professor George Thomas, director of the Salvatore Center for the Study of Individual Freedom in the Modern World, will be talking to us today with one of his students. And Professor, Professor Esther Chung Kim, associate director of the Gould Center for Humanistic Studies, um, is here with one of her students to talk about work at the Gould Center. So I will hand it over first to Professor Bill Asher um, to uh, introduce the student he's also working with at the Institute and to say a few words about the work they've done around the theme global climate change. Bill? Thanks. Um, yeah. Shauna loves the institutes and centers. I love them even more because I've been 20 years. For a long time, I had an affiliation, still do, with the Kravis Leadership, Leadership Institute, maybe because I came here as the academic dean. I benefited from the Berger Institute, which has provided me research assistance working on poverty alleviation. I've had many research assistants funded by the Keck Center on a host of international projects. One student was actually funded by the Gould Center working on identity formation in Thailand. And I supervised a couple students who are funded by the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Now, because I've been directing the Roberts Environmental Center for six years, we thought it'd be great to try to get a lot of collaboration working on the issue of global climate change and to go to various institutes and centers to see if they could chip in on this. We had very ambitious plans originally, but when the pandemic hit, we decided the best thing to do was to try to enhance some of our curricular offerings by putting together a truly unique course. We went to the McGrubian Center Wendy Lauer and said, could you get somebody who could run three or four students working on environmental refugees and how the global climate change issue affects their human rights? We went to the Berger Institute with Stacy Doan. What are the psychological aspects of global climate change? We went to Lowe to see if somebody could talk about the economic aspects. And Laura Grant is doing that with her team of three or four people. Went to the Keck Center and Katya Favretto was endorsed by Hillary Apple to look at some of the international and diplomacy aspects of this. So we have these four teams and Chris Agar will now describe the work of his team. Take it away, Chris. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Professor Asher. My name is Chris Agard. I'm a senior here at CMC. 
And so I'm on a team with Professor Wendy Lauer. Um, and we initially started off thinking about um, kind of the human rights consequences of global climate change. So the question we first asked um, that we were kind of basing our project off of was how does climate change become a threat multiplier for human rights abuses? So we set out to um, answer this question by looking at um, comparative case studies between three um, different countries who are facing um, different climate change issues. So the first is Tuvalu, which is um, a collection of islands in the South Pacific um, or in the Pacific, um, whose issue is primarily rising sea levels. It's a very small country. Um, and yeah, that's like the issue they face. The second was Brazil, um, which contains the majority of the Amazon rainforest, which is dealing with issues of deforestation um, and flooding amongst um, many other issues. And then the third is India, um, which faces extreme heat. So I'm on a team, like I said, led by Professor Lauer um, with two students, two juniors, as well as a recent graduate um, from the class of 2019, um, whose specialization um, is in these issues in India. And then we are also being assisted by um, an older alumni, um, uh, Stephen McGann, who was the former um, ambassador um, for the United States to Tulu. Um, so he's got a great deal of expertise on kind of the issues they face there. Um, so Rich and uh, Ambassador McGann also suggested, us, suggested to us to focus on perhaps human security um, more broadly than human rights. Think about all of the kind of different um, issues that may arise um, on like the human level um, from climate change. So right now we're really just trying to kind of understand all of the um, context, the infrastructure issues, the political um, situation or circumstances in these different countries to kind of get like a holistic view of um, what's going on and to best understand how to um, how to address um, these issues that arise from climate change. Um, so each of us kind of has, I guess, the region or the country that we're most um, interested in, in kind of understanding this issue. Um, and I am just really interested in understanding better Brazil, given um, its political context and how um, the nation itself is um, addressing this issue of climate change historically and kind of what's been changing in the past few years and what that means for um, human security um, in the future. So yeah, that's a little bit about um, what we've been doing with Professor Lauer this semester. Let me add that every month we have an all hands meeting so that the teams can compare notes. And we've already been struck with the kind of overlap of the issues that are, that are being looked at. The economic issues, the international issues also pertain a lot to the kinds of human rights and human security issues that Chris and his group are looking at. I think now the floor is open for any questions or comments that people might want to make. Absolutely, we have a couple of minutes. If anybody wants to ask a question of the work or put something into the chat, either a comment or a question, please go ahead and do so. Uh, Chris is um, one of our Athenaeum fellows, so he's used to asking all the questions, so it's kind of fun to <laughs> turn it back around on him. So, Mark, I see that you, Mark Brody, I see that you unmuted. Do you have a question or comment? Well, I had a, a question for Professor, Professor Asher. I was, I'm grateful for the work you do in bringing together so many institutes on the global climate change. I was hoping that we could also look at this through the lens of what's now being called the Anthropocene and how that raises the topic of how we perceive ourselves in this age and how our social political institutions are gonna react to climate change. So I just think that's another 
Uh, you're already taking this on in a multidisciplinary way, but I think looking at the Anthropocene and much that's being researched and written about could be helpful as well. I think that's an excellent point. And uh, Stacy Doan's group looking at human factors and psychology is touching on that, but certainly that could be expanded uh, to something even broader. I just wanted to add one other short comment was, I love the Athenaeum and I feel that that is a forum or an opportunity to expand programming of this type. Um, so I would encourage the institutes to come together and kind of go for the, the dream team that we might bring to the Athenaeum for a global climate initiative or an Anthropocene theme. So thank you, Evan. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. I know Mark Schwartz, if you want to ask your question, uh, go ahead. So my question is about how a student makes a decision uh, to um, work in a specific institute. Um, it, it seems to me that um, as a freshman, um, maybe it's different now when you get accepted to CMC, you're sort of have a, you know, path um, already uh, charted because uh, you wouldn't have gotten in because uh, if you didn't know exactly what you wanted to become, um, CMC wouldn't have uh, admitted you. But Chris, maybe you can answer, um, how did you, you know, come to select your um, institute? Um, what happens if a student doesn't know and, you know, how do you experiment and take advantage of the, you know, educational buffet that CMC offers? Yeah, so um, I'll say that I didn't really recognize how kind of unique it was that we have all these different um, institutes at CMC until later in my time here. But, um, and it is, um, it is like very overwhelming with all the different um, institutes. I think what kind of draws me to um, kind of looking at the human rights, and I also was a um, research assistant for the Magrubian Center as a sophomore, um, is just kind of thinking about um, the consequences of different um, actions and um, yeah, just different actions and events that they have on actual people and to kind of um, think about like the um, about very vulnerable populations or groups of people in any um, society or country. Um, and I think that the human rights aspect or perspective is a really um, important and great way to look at those issues and to hopefully like come up with some solutions or think of different ways to um, really um, do something um, that I would see as um, meaningful. So that's kind of like my um, influence or my motivation rather um, to uh, work from this human rights perspective. And let me just add one more word before turning it back over to Shauna. Some students actually will go from one institute or center and then switch to another one. Some actually will work with two of them. Also, we've delayed the application process now so that when the freshmen come in like deer in the headlights, they have a little bit more time to explore to see which ones they're gonna be interested in. And now back to Shauna. Thank you. Thanks, Bill and Chris, that was wonderful. I'd like to turn it over now to Professor Hillary Apple of the Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about the institutes. And I agree with what everyone has said that it is really uh, just one of the most extraordinary things about Claremont McKenna College. All of these opportunities that are created across so many disciplines and so many you know, intellectual interests as a result of the institutes. And the institutes um, are really valuable for some curricular programs, but primarily for co-curricular programming to supplement our academic program. What I've been asked to talk about today in terms of how the Keck Center has contributed to the President's initiative 
on uh, anti-racism and the Black experience is a, a specific program that is both curricular and co-curricular. So that's what I'll talk to you about today. But of course, we have all sorts of programs to support our students, uh, whether it's our, our new podcasting program or our traditional program of uh, providing research opportunities uh, as RAs for faculty members, students working with professors and for professors, as well as our Asia Experts Forum and the Journalism Lab. We have all sorts of opportunities, but today I'm going to talk about our contribution to this specific initiative. So many of us were contacted over the summer to see what our institutes might do to contribute to this effort. And uh, I sat down and thought about what could we do, you know, given um, that we were an internationally oriented institute, what should we be doing? And I spoke with different colleagues and I developed a program with my colleague, Professor Jennifer Ta, which is both curricular and co-curricular. So the curricular part, uh, portion of this is a course. We took uh, 16 students originally to, to enroll in this course. They applied independently with a, a very short essay about why they wanted to take a course. The course is a special topics course called Race, Gender, and Identity in International Relations. And this is a course where we study uh, the both the theory and the practice of international relations and try to see why these areas are so underdeveloped, in particular race and gender. So there's um, not that much writing on race, but we were able to uh, put together actually a very uh, interesting syllabus of different kinds of readings. So the class meets weekly on Wednesdays where we discuss readings on race, uh, gender identity. But we also have another component of this, which is a speaker series, a uh, guest lecture series of experts to come and talk to us. And the course is academic and it's sort of theoretical limitations of the study of race in IR theory in the canon, but it's also focused on professional development. So we're interested in how race and uh, gender and identity are relevant to the practice of international relations. So one of our speakers, for example, was a diplomat working in the Foreign Service in Hong Kong talking about what it meant to be an Asian American working in the Foreign Service, in his case in Asia, and some of the challenges he faced uh, being uh, understood by local populations as representing the United States of America. So it was very interesting just to hear his perspective, and he helped the students think about certain issues that they might face when they are in the working world, um, whether it's in the public sector or the private sector in international fields uh, related to race and identity. So we have our coursework, we have our speaker series, and then we also have another piece of this, which is a mentorship program where everyone in the class is linked up with an alumni mentor. And so this is something I bring to you, those of you who are alumni in our audience. If this is something that you would like to be a part of in future iterations, we're looking for members of the alumni who could mentor students. So it was a one on one matchup with members of the class with people in the alumni who were either of underrepresented groups in the area of international relations or that they were supervisors of people and had to deal with issues of race and gender and identity in the workplace. So if this is something you might be interested in doing, we would love to hear from you at the Keck Center. That would be fantastic. Um, you can always write me, you can write uh, your name in the chat that we'll reach out to you. So we'll continue this program. And this is a way in which students can have some professional development. And since I would say it's about two thirds of our students who identify as um, students of color, this has been uh, hopefully a, a very deliberate program to link them up with people who've had experience either as um, uh, uh, people of color or again, supervising uh, you know, work staff, mentoring uh, younger people of color to try to help them out. And it's not just um, identity based on race and ethnicity, but also gender as well. Now I have a student with me today, Sarah Chen, but I'm going to ask her to come online and talk about the final piece of our program, which is a major research project that can take multiple forms. It can be the form of a, a research paper, a series of podcasts, all sorts of different ideas. Sarah will tell you about hers, in which she is matched up with a professor that has expertise in her specific area. We have professors from across the different disciplines, but in fact, she is with an IR professor. Uh, anyone with expertise to help students develop the research project beyond uh, Professor Ta and what I can provide. So Sarah, please talk a little bit about your research project and uh, maybe the mentorship piece. 
Sure. So I'll quickly start off with the mentorship piece. So I was matched with Laura Ease, who is the current director of global security services at Expedia. Um, and in my conversations with her, it was super duper helpful because I'm really interested in the cybersec field, which has traditionally been, you know, a male dominated field. So I wanted to hear about what her experiences were like moving into that field and how she found sort of the work environment. Um, on top of that, moving into the research itself, uh, I'm taking a pretty non-traditional research project where I'm trying to create an interactive documentary on cyber feminism. So it's based off of Donna Haraway's A Cyborg's Manifesto, which she wrote in the 1980s. And it's one of the first works that people typically look towards when you think of cyber feminism as an ideological movement. So I broke down her a piece into several points that I would like to explore, such as the fusion of man and machine, the lack of distinction between the physical and the femoral in regards to the internet, um, subversion of informatics of domination. And then I matched these two current day cases happening all around the world in two variations. The first is how um, technologies have hurt women or have oppressed women. And the second is reimagining those technologies or those case studies through a cyber feminist lens. Um, so, like, for instance, one example is on the informatics of domination, I look at how uh, artificial intelligence algorithm filtering on social media platforms has either oppressed female speech or has allowed, you know, negative speech and hate speech to gain more prominence. However, you have this alternative side where actually the existence of social media platforms in and of themselves has allowed women to have a lot more free speech, particularly in countries where uh, they're, they don't see the same freedoms as they do in the United States. So that's been really, really fascinating work, uh, especially dealing with um, the non-traditional medium of an interactive documentary, which I really appreciate getting to explore because most of my projects have been your standard research paper. So getting in touch with, you know, my more creative side, particularly when I have more time since we're all online, uh, has been an amazing opportunity. Thank you so much to both Hillary and Sarah. Um, can we uh, open it up for some questions? Sure. If anyone has a, a question or wants to raise their hand, uh, put it in the chat or virtually raise your hand in the participant area. Uh, Sarah, something came through just, just asking about how how you and maybe your other research assistant colleagues are, are doing this research remotely. How is that kind of working right now? Sure. So I can speak for myself, I guess. Um, personally, it's actually been a lot easier in a sense because you have so many more opportunities to go to events and seminars that you normally wouldn't have access to because they'd be in person. Um, for example, this week I was watching uh, Professor Mindy Sue present on the Cyber Feminist Index. Um, and because of that, now I'm planning on first like <laughs> exploring what her Cyber Feminist Index is, which is this incredible resource of like 50 different cyber feminist pieces that she's been collecting over the years in her analysis of them. And also I'm planning on just recent, reaching out to her and cold emailing her to see if she'd be willing to speak to me. And Hillary, how has it been working with, uh, with students who are remote? It's so unusual to not have, you know, the end of the Keck Center has a library and it has a beautiful view on the third floor of the Kravis Center. So how are, how are you working with students right now in this virtual world? Well, it definitely is a challenge. So we started off the semester thinking about what we should be doing given the, you know, distance learning that we're all doing. And we did come up with different programs like podcasting, which was new for us. But I would agree with Sarah that it also presents certain opportunities because everyone um, is also stuck at home. And so therefore, we've been very successful in reaching out to people and asking them to visit our classes, including I mentioned this class, we had Kelly Bogivile Zvogbo speak, and she has she's very much in demand right now. She she published a paper in international, um, sorry, in foreign policy this summer on why race matters in international relations, and she was our first speaker. And she was willing just to pop in for the hour in a way that sometimes speakers in the past we wouldn't have done it that way. We would have brought them in. They would have sat down around a table with us. That's still the gold standard. That's still our preference, but you can have many more speakers uh, using the same amount of resources and people are much more willing to say uh, yes. And so another initiative of the center this year is to have 
told uh, faculty in international relations courses that if they want to have guest uh, lecturers, authors they've assigned or special speakers uh, meet with their students that we would uh, support that financially. So the college is doing that, but we wanted to expand that. So for example, just on Tuesday, I had the former US ambassador to Russia, Mike McFall, meet with my introduction to comparative government students. It's not even my Russian politics seminar this semester. And here he's speaking with uh, the combined group of 30 undergraduates, just entirely an hour and a half of Q&A with the students. The students could ask them anything they wanted. And that's not something you can do very easily. Um, because he would be too busy, he's all, you know, and, and also it would be a little bit unusual for him to, to sit down with a group of our size and of our rank, let's say, you know, he would be speaking uh, on NBC News or, or, or the Aspen Institute or at Brookings or, you know, so for him to spend an hour and a half like that was really special and we could do that much more easily. He's come to campus before, he was the inaugural speaker at the Athenaeum for the Kennan Lecture Series. Um, and that was seven years ago. But this was a really, you know, this was, you could, you could do many more of these. You can just add it during class time. So even though it is um, suboptimal, I'd still rather have people like this on campus and have our students around a table talking to him. Uh, nonetheless, we can still do a lot. And in fact, we can ramp up our level of activity because of the circumstances. Thanks, Fabulous. Hillary. Thank hey, you. One, one quick question, if I could, Sean, is very oh, quick sure. for Sarah. Uh, Sarah, could you give us a definition of cyber feminism? Someone asked about a little more clarity on that. So I can't actually give you the definition of cyber feminism because it's one of those things that is deliberately undefined, which I know is a cop out answer. Um, what I can say about it, though, is it is very much both a movement and a lens through which to view the world. So it's a movement in that it's an idea that the internet is supposed to be a space where women are empowered and where you can, you know, throw off the shackles of typical gender norms and stereotypes. And it's also a lens through which to critique what they call, you know, the Silicon Valley bro culture um, in America. So, sorry, that's very much a non-answer, but it has been represented mainly through art pieces and through a lot of uh, gatherings. And so there isn't much, you know, formal ideological text on it. Thank you. Um, let us uh, introduce Professor George Thomas, director of the Salvatore Center for the Study of Individual Freedom in the Modern World. Hey, George. Hi, well, um, thank you all for being here. Uh, and I, I suppose I'll just echo what so many people have said. Uh, I mean, the the thing about the Institute centers is, I mean, they, not only do they do so much great work in programming, but really there's a lot of interaction between them. I won't actually highlight all of that uh, today, but as a faculty member and prior to becoming an Institute director, I mean, I, I think I primarily benefited from <laughs> Salvatore, but I worked with the other institutes. Um, you know, I, I got research assistance from them. I had students work with them. I uh, research grants, you know, brought speakers in. So, uh, I mean, they really are a unique, part of the liberal arts college experience at CMC. So I'm, I will just kind of speak broadly about what Salvatore is doing along two fronts. Uh, first, the president's anti-racism initiative and then the Open Academy initiative. And so let me start just with what some of uh, the innovations we've had this year with regard to the president's anti-racism initiative. And the first thing, and, and, and um, like uh, Hillary with the Keck Center, the first thing we did was have some curricular innovations. The Salvatore Center is sponsoring what actually turn out to be four mini courses or half credit courses that are on issues of race. I'm doing one of the courses, it's race in the constitution. And it's you know primarily a look at how has the Supreme Court treated uh, in constitutional terms um, race over the course of American constitutional history, um, you know, and actually the 19th century, revisiting it in detail was, uh, you know, a, a, great, a really depressing century with a great moment um, with the Civil War amendments that got eclipsed. Um, we finally hit Brown v. the Board of Education, so things are looking better um, for the next several weeks. But the other uh, course we've sponsored is um, Professor John Shields' Policing the American City course. And this course was actually so popular and also Professor Shields just so generous that he's actually doing three sections um, of this course and will be offering a uh, section of it in the spring semester 
as well. And the idea with both of these courses and why we, you know, mini courses or half credit courses and, you know, credit, non-credit, the idea really is just to take uh, something that's of obvious interest to us and, it, you know, get students to explore it in ways that don't necessarily have the burdens of traditional courses, but that, um, you know, they're obviously wanting to engage with and, you know, but not just engage it in a way that's kind of current eventsy, but, you know, plumb um, the uh, topic, especially policing the American city with shields in ways that I think you don't necessarily get in the, um, you know, current discussion of it. So um, that's one area where we're doing things. And the, the other area, and this is actually with Professor Shields as well, the first one is at least, he's organizing a panel on just what is anti-racism. I mean, we, we speak to it um, in some sense, uh, but it's actually, you know, very much a contested term. And so in, in that sense, that kind of complements the Open uh, Academy initiative. And so we're going to have a panel that bring together leading scholars of anti-racism. Um, but the idea is to, you know, put it in context of a, of a question and how we really should think about it. The catch with that one, as well as the next thing I'm going to mention, is we've decided um, for all of the benefits of Zoom um, that Professor Apple just spoke to, there are downsides. And so we've decided we've been running enough that we think maybe people are a little Zoomed out with events. Um, so we're hoping to have this one crossing our fingers uh, in person in the spring. Um, if not, it will be a Zoom event early in the spring semester. And the other thing that we're actually hoping to run in person is Salvatore Center has done these Saturday seminars. And again, they're also just these opportunities. I think actually um, Sarah Chen has done at least one of them um, at Salvatore, thinking of how students from CAC come and do uh, events at other institutes. Um, we've, we've run them on just topics that are of interest uh, and the idea is just to kind of set aside any notion of grading or taking a class, spend a Saturday engaged in um, reading some material and discussing it with the professor. We've done, and we've done these now, uh, this will be our third year and they've been very popular. We get, uh, you know, 50 plus applications across the five C's for 12 um, seats in the seminar. And we've done them on free speech. We've done them on populism. We've done them on um, can capitalism sustain itself. We're, we will be doing one in the spring semester on race and American identity, the same kind of uh, idea. So just coming together for one Saturday uh, for students to engage the issue. And again, this also, and I'll uh, you know, transition here, complements the whole notion of the Open Academy Initiative that you know, many of the questions we are wrestling with are questions and they're questions with multiple sides that we ought to be exploring uh, and engaging in. And so on that front, Salva you know, the Salvatore Center has taken a lot of what it would be kind of traditional, say, Athenaeum programming. And uh, I, you know, I've really tried to, to work to put that in the context of discussions and questions. So we don't just have one speaker engaging the issue, but we have a few speakers or a panel actually speaking uh, to important questions. Just so, for instance, we, um, I guess we didn't kick off the ath. We were set to kick off the ath, but we started early um, this year. But we had a discussion on original meaning and constitutional interpretation with two leading legal scholars, Stephen Calabrese and Akhil Amar. Turns out, actually, it was on the night um, uh, that Justice Ginsburg passed away, I want to say. So they, they didn't actually speak to, to those issues, but they had um, a discussion about it. And then we're doing that to, if, if you're not zoomed out, starting at 5 p.m. at the ATH, there will be a discussion of the 19th Amendment and gender equality with Elizabeth Wydra, who is a CMC alum uh, and director of the Constitutional Accountability Center, and um, Elizabeth Beaumont, who's actually a Pomona alum. And again, the whole point is to actually, you know, put these um, ATH events in the, in the context of a discussion and disagreement um, and to think about something like gender equality in the 19th Amendment um, going forward. And I'll also just plug the students here. Um, two of our students couldn't make it um, to this event because they're actually interviewing right now Elizabeth Wydra uh, about the Supreme Court confirmation going on, um, Judge Barrett, uh, and the future of the Supreme Court and things like court packing, which we'll eventually post to Salvatore's website. Um, so those students are actually actively engaged uh, in this kind of research now. And then and this maybe is a little bit overload, but this is also the sort of thing that we're doing open academy wise tomorrow morning, um, 11 a.m. at on the East Coast, 8 a.m. here, which is a little unfortunate, we've paired with the American Enterprise Institute 
to bring together um, a number of uh, both practitioners and scholars um, from the Brookings Institution, AEI, and then um, a couple from academic backgrounds to talk about Congress and constitutional reform. Again, the point of the events is really just to kind of situate important and pressing um, issues in terms of, you know, the debates and questions they raise and have a discussion which includes, you know, pretty intense disagreement um, about issues. Um, and those events are all, I mean, this is one of the great things about Zoom. Um, in the ideal world, this AEI event was supposed to be uh, an opportunity to go to DC and take six students to DC with us as we did last year. And, you know, they could network and meet with alumni. Um, can't do that in person now, but uh, the upside is the event's now online and so it's open um, to all. Uh, on that notion, I will turn things over to Samuel Fisk, uh, who is the student manager at Salvatore Center and will speak to a few things the students are doing. All right, thanks Professor Thomas. Uh, so I am a senior at Claremont McKenna College. I'm also the student director of research at the Salvatore Center and a student manager. Uh, quickly, I'll just talk about my research and then talk about some of the general aims of the Institute. So for the past about six months, I've been looking into free speech and fake news on the internet and looking at ways in which our constitution may have evolved to deal with issues of misinformation on websites like Facebook and Twitter. So the idea is that uh, the First Amendment was written, you know, hundreds of years ago, but we're still looking at ways it can affect our life now. Um, additionally, we've done research on voter rights and technology that has been incredibly accurate in allowing gerrymandering and seeing ways in which modern problems has affected a constitution and the ways in which our government functions. Additionally, now it's been about 100 years past the 19th Amendment, and one of our other researchers is doing research on the 19th Amendment and the evolution of voting rights over the course of the United States history. So, generally speaking, our research has been directed at looking at ways in which modern problems have fit into the general political philosophy of the United States and constitutional issues which may deep date back hundreds of years. Um, generally speaking, we try to do this through podcasts, uh, internet videos, we've done a series on the Supreme Court rulings in the past five years, and then also research papers which we're seeking to publish both on our own website and through the Claremont Journal of Law and Public Policy. Uh, for anyone who has any other questions, I'm more than willing to answer them in terms of, you know, why I decided to do research or what I see as the value as an undergrad. Uh, but quickly, I'll just answer that, generally speaking. Uh, so about 60 to 70 percent of students do research at CMC through one of our 11 research institutes. And when you're applying to something like a graduate school or law school or even applying for a job, it gives you a really unique leg up on the competition. Um, it's one of those things where we have the shared consortium where it's really nice to benefit from the other colleges, but the research institutes are exclusive to CMC and I think it's one of the best resources that we have. Um, so if there are any other questions, I'm more than willing to answer them. And thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you so much, Sam and George. Uh, questions about the Salvatore Center? Robin. Robin asked a, a question that was that was spurred by um, this presentation, but also goes a little bit more towards all the institutes. Um, and he really talked about you know all the great work that Salvatore is doing. Um, sorry, I lost the question here, which is so unlike me. But he wants to he wants to know how places like Salvatore are really spreading their their research, sharing what the students are are learning. How are we getting the message out there? Sam? Sure. Yeah. So one of the ways we're trying to engage with students is through social media, the stuff I'm criticizing in my paper, actually, but uh, things like Instagram and Facebook. And then we also have just flyers that we keep around in school. Um, now that everything's on Zoom, the barrier to entry is pretty low when it comes to getting to an event. I mean, all you guys are in your homes, you're just kind of clicking on a link and showing up. So we found that it's actually pretty easy to get people to come to talks. So the real barrier then is just getting interesting speakers and making sure that we have a time that people can get engaged with. Uh, I've personally found in the Zoom format, it's really easy just to hop on a call for 30 minutes. So we had a really good response to our past um, ATH talk with Akhil Amar and the other Yale professor. And I expect to have a similar response tonight with our uh, ATH talk in 10 minutes. 
All right, thank you so much. To um, allow enough time for our last presentation, I would like to hand it over to Professor Esther Chung Kim, Associate Director of the Gould Center for Humanistic Studies. Esther, welcome. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen so that people can see a couple of things that I wanna share with you about the Gould Center. The Gould Center has developed quite a bit, especially recently under the new directorship of Professor Amy Kind. And we have been working on a variety of new initiatives. But I think the two things I wanna mention. First is the reality that research institutes at other colleges and universities actually could mean something different. So the, I wanted to emphasize that research institutes at CMC actually focus quite, I would say, an enormous amount of its resources and energy on student research. In many other research institutes, the focus is actually on faculty research. Um, here we try to strike a balance, but I'm always impressed by how much energy is given to the students and supporting their research in these institutes. So I think that's actually a un more unique quality that some people may not fully realize. So I wanted to highlight that. Secondly, I want to highlight that the Gould Center actually is the house or the center that covers five different departments at CMC. I've listed them here. Uh, we cover the philosophy department, the religious studies, literature, history, and modern languages. And so we are already a multidisciplinary institute just by ourselves. Uh, but we, of course, we do partner with other institutes and a lot of our students, as we've already heard, do go back and forth between the centers and learn from different aspects, especially in this case with the humanities. So we do a lot of programming throughout the school or the academic year, including something called the Humanity Labs, which focus on a variety of themes where a professor works with a small group of people. This is outside of class. Uh, they do get funding for it and support for it, and they work on team projects. So this is areas of research and usually based on some theme that the professor has posted uh, ahead of time. And usually this year, we in the past have always done two humanity labs. This year, there was so much interest in that we've actually had to expand to three humanity labs, and they are all filled to the max. So. Uh, there's definitely a quite a bit of interest in the humanities and uh, in, th in these programs. Today I want to actually highlight student opportunities over the summer. Summer is a great time for students to focus on projects they normally can't do or are too busy to do during the school year. And so I want to focus on two in particular. The first is the Creative Works Fellows. The Creative Works Fellows started two years ago and it allows students to basically explore something that matters to them. It is one of the few projects, I think, where students can really get creative in creating a program and basically getting support funding with a faculty advisor one-on-one -on -one for 10 to 12 weeks in the summer. The options are quite endless. And this year, many of the Creative Works Fellows focused on pressing issues of 2020. So things like COVID-19 was a very popular topic, as well as addressing issues of racism and promoting cross-cultural understanding. So I'm gonna just show you, go to the next slide. These are some of our Creative Summer Works Fellows. I've just had their pictures here. One of the things uh, I wanna point out, I can't go through all of their works, but there definitely were people who covered how COVID was affecting Central California by looking specifically at Latino labor and labor, Latino workers. We had people looking at how COVID was affecting, the pandemic was affecting prison systems. And finally, I wanna mention that we had another student work on a podcast on local governments. So it seemed like a focus on municipal grassroots work. As he did that project, he realized it was right in the middle of the summer, right after the George, uh, George Floyd killing. And so he ended up devoting four out of his seven podcasts to the role of local government in uh, issues of racism. 
So many students explored that. In their next, in my next slide, let's see if I can move that to that, the Dunbar Fellows were a special program that launched this summer. And that Dunbar Fellows is actually based on a theme. And this year's theme was the power of the humanities in a pandemic. And so today I have for you Mayella Norwood, who will be speaking to us about her project. Mayella, do you want to go? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, Annette is here as well, so we'll be splitting up our time, but hi, I'm Majela Norwood. I'm Annette and Jay, and this summer we had the opportunity of being Dunbar Fellows, examining the power of the humanities during a pandemic. As two students who are passionate about healthcare in the Black community, we decided to research how the United States healthcare system upholds the institutions of racism and classism, essentially perpetuating systematic oppression on the Black community during the global pandemic. In doing so, we realized that there were multiple areas associated with a better understanding of the Black healthcare experience. However, our advisor reminded us that we weren't writing our senior thesis, so we had to adjust our plans just a little bit. I researched different areas, including Black, historical Black healthcare, with an emphasis on the Jim Crow era, the manipulation of media platforms, and the experiences of healthcare professionals and patients. What was extremely profound was the effect that media platforms, namely credible organizations, had on the mentalities of non-Black Americans. For instance, the absentee Black dad is a common stereotype that has been portrayed by media platforms like CNN. When in reality, according to a 2013 study conducted by the CT CDC, the Black father actually spends the most time engaged with his children in comparison to fathers of other races. These racially based portrayals not only pathologize Black families and idealize white families with respect to poverty and crime, but also psychologically damage Black children. Beyond the media, the interviews that I conducted with healthcare professionals and patients revealed that many Black Americans are suffering at the ex expense of our skin tones even when we are the healthcare professionals ourselves. Often patients were questioned about their capacity to understand and withstand their pain, a common and harmful stereotype that contributes to the poor quality of healthcare that Black people receive on a daily basis. During our research, I discovered how prominent race-based healthcare is and how detrimental it is for the health, the health and lives of Black people. A lot of these ideas stem from the historical procession of Black bodies being able to endure a large degree of pain when in reality that is not the case. In the case of COVID, Black people were dying two times the percentage of their population. We also looked at classism. And for this, we focused on education, housing conditions, and healthcare. These are the three things that are taken from the Black community so quickly which makes it difficult for members to access jobs that allow them to work remotely, making us more vulnerable to the disease, or clinics and hospitals in order to receive adequate care. We concluded our project by turning inward and examining the effects of COVID in our personal lives and our communities. As individuals who want to pursue careers in healthcare, we realize that it's important to be aware and critical of the oppressive institutions that surround us. We understand and acknowledge that we have only scratched the surface and that there is more work that needs to be done for the Black community and our health. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for putting the link to your project. I do encourage anyone to click on that link and read up a little more. Uh, if anyone has any questions or comments here, please do put them in the chat. Campbell Streeter raised his hand. Campbell, go ahead and unmute and ask directly. Awesome. Thanks, Evan. Um, I actually was a research associate, uh, or assistant, sorry, for Professor Chung Kim back in my freshman year. So that was a while ago now, but it was super exciting. Uh, I have a question kind of to all the institutes, which is, you know, the Rose Institute is kind of on the tour by built-in location, and some of the institutes kind of get a little bit more play, I think, with the student body, because um, a lot of the students at CNC, you know, it's the same subgroup of students does a lot of the same stuff. And so, I'm kind of curious to know how some of the other institutes and CMC as an institution are trying to make sure that you know the student body hears about the other institutes. I was a history major uh, and I don't think I heard about the Gould Institute until I was a senior and kind of had missed my opportunity to get really involved. So I'm kind of curious how you guys are trying to make sure that students hear about the, the breadth of institutes available. Thanks, Campbell. Um, I'm glad you asked uh, because one of the questions that I actually wanted to answer that came up earlier was about how are these opportunities available to students? And someone mentioned, like, if you don't get on in your first year, there was a lot of anxiety among students. Like, if they don't get the right position in their first year, 
then they're doomed. I mean, this was some sort of like anxiety I heard among some students. So one of the things that the Gould Center has done is we have done, we have actually spent a lot more energy in doing that outreach to reach students. And we've done it in two, well, at least two ways. One is we definitely have a board, which is made up of usually alumni who support humanities related topics and humanity related, related activities. For example, we have a board member or former alum who's doing a television um, workshop for students to write a television episode, right? So they get involved in things like that. So as far as students are concerned though, we also have a student board. So it's not just a board of, we have student managers as well, but we have a board of just student advisors and they are at every level, at every year. The other thing we have is things like the Creative Works Fellowships. We are actually trying to, re any, a, any year can apply for that, but we're actually trying to target sophomores who are rising juniors because we find that that is the best summer to like explore creative works and actually have students just follow their passion or whatever matters to them. We also have students who are, you know, getting in the humanities labs. A lot of them are doing that as juniors and seniors. And then now we have the Dunbar Fellows and I'm sure they come from all different um, years as well. But I do think there has been an sort of a step up in efforts at least for the Gould Center, which are trying to reach out to multiple humanity students, but also trying to find uh, this places where students can onboard and get involved at research at multiple levels and at any, and at any given time during their time at CNC. So if Campbell wanted to get involved as a senior, there would be uh, opportunities just as a freshman who just joined CMC as well. Thank you so much. And in answer, just um, by way of closing, in answer to a couple of uh, questions that I saw in the chat about the institutes as a whole, um, uh, Esther, that was that was fantastic that you put up all the um, humanities departments uh, covered by the Gould Center, so everyone could see the multidisciplinary nature of the Gould Center itself. Um, we also have the Magrublian Center um, for Human Rights, which is currently directed by a, by, um, a historian. And we have two um, institutes currently directed by psychologists, um, the Berger Institute for Individual and Social Development and our Kravis Leadership Institute. And then um, uh, some of the institutes are now directed by professors in the government department, Roberts Environmental Center, Rose Institute um, for State and Local Government, Salvatore Center for Individual uh, Freedom in the Modern World, and Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies. So we heard from several of those directors today. And then we have, um, we have three institutes currently directed by economists, um, Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Financial Economics Institute, and the Lowe Institute for Political Economy. So you sort of get a sense that we really, the institute Institutes really span the gamut. So even though um, one institute or another might stand out um, given someone's particular area of interest, there really are, we really do span um, all of the fields of our academic departments um, in our institute uh, landscape. So I wanted to thank you so much um, for coming today, for joining us. If you'd like more information about the Institutes, Evan, um, put our Institutes Gateway into the chat. You can find it on the CMC homepage under research. And there is a really cool two and a half minute video that will give you an overview of the entire um, landscape of the 11 research institutes and centers um, if you have more questions about the institutes as a whole. So thank you so much to everyone and Evan I'll hand it over to you. Thank you Shauna. Thank you to all our professors and, and our students who um, gave us a fantastic overview of the research. It really is a, a thrill and an honor to be able to see what you're doing um, outside of the classroom um, with our with our incredible faculty. So thank you. I know we couldn't get to all the questions. I know there's other comments in there. Um, we have hundreds of students who work at the institutes, and all of our students and all of our fa and all of our faculty benefit from uh, from them being on campus and from their great work. So thank you all. We hope to see you next week for our programming on Wednesday at 4 p.m. We have the Saul Center for Student Opportunity talking about how CMC recruits, especially in these unusual COVID-19, and how alumni and parents can help with the recruitment process. And on Thursday, we'll do, we'll do a deep dive into the presidential initiative on anti-racism and the black experience in America with Associate Vice President and Chief Civil Rights Officer, Nere Gray. Thank you everybody, have a great night and be well.